Washington Journal continues. Joining us now from Oxford, New York, is John Henry Gatto. Mr. Gatto, good morning to you. Good morning. It's John Taylor Gatto. I'm, where did I get John Henry? I don't know, but I sure appreciate your correcting me. I feel like John Henry. <laughs> um, John Taylor Gatto is a former New York City Teacher of the Year and New York State Teacher of the Year. He has a new piece in this month's Harper's Against School, How Public Education Cripples Our Kids and Why. Mr. Gatto, what's your basic theme here? Well, my basic theme, I suppose, would be that schools are dangerous places for kids. They retard intellectual development. They retard moral development. They bankrupt communities financially by bleeding hundreds of billions of dollars into unproductive uh, activity. And they bleed communities dynamically by taking the energies of children away from the general society and dissipating them. They're places of intimidation, bullying, sexual harassment, criminality, and even arson and murder. And the epidemic of national obesity can be traced, I think, to the training ground of the school cafeteria. Okay, there's a lot of ground to cover there. Should, <laughs> uh, uh, should, school, should schooling be compulsory? It should not be compulsory. And technically, it is not. At least government schooling is not, because if you have enough money... You can go into private schooling. If you have enough courage, as two million Americans do, you can go into homeschooling. But in fact, it's compulsory de facto. Does the government require uh, kids to go to some type of school? Yes, yes. And Until 90%, when? 88 to 90% of the kids of necessity go to a government school, and these places are centrally managed from observation posts far away from local communities. Local action in schooling is mostly an illusion. Um, let's go through some of the points in your article. We're also going to be taking your calls. The lines are divided by Democrats, Republicans, and all others. And we have a fourth line set aside this morning for students and teachers, 202-585-3883. Mr. Gatto, you write that boredom is a common condition of school teachers as well as children. Well, it is. It is. When you set aside an enormous part of your waking day, and the activities in, in, in that day are are largely confined activities. They're anti-intellectual. Uh, the, the physical restraint is enormous. There's a little psychological laboratory in each classroom that happens quite apart from, from any academic pretense, and it's filled with intimidation and bullying. So, so what's the solution then? If school shouldn't be compulsory, school is set up the wrong way, where, where do we go? Well, there, there are two places, I think, to look to easily see alternatives. One of those is, is in the elite private boarding schools, which people mistakenly think uh, are expensive. They are expensive to enroll in, but there are activities that take place under, uh, behind the closed door of the classroom are absolutely free and Two million homeschoolers have picked up on this. You can get a superb education for absolutely no money at all. Uh, what's your experience in the classroom? How long were you there? I was in the classroom for 30 years. And in the course of that time, I taught the wealthiest people in New York City's kids, the, the ones who had... Uh, uh, a strong liberal bias and sent their kids to public schools even though they could have afforded private and I taught the poorest kids. I probably split half my time in the Gold Coast to the Upper West Side and half my time in Harlem and Spanish Harlem. And it, it sounds from your article like you got in a bit of a trouble with the administration. Well, the, what, what brought me to blows with the administration was that I was successful in forging liaisons with parents, with operating a kind of independent study program with kids where we would negotiate back and forth for something that was educationally worthwhile in place of uh, the school diet. Uh, for treating people like human beings, I think, is basically why I got in trouble. And I'm not suggesting here 
that any assistant principal, principal, or superintendent is in on the directly in on the tragedy of schooling. They're employees. They have no wiggle room at all. And there are 20 people waiting for each one of those jobs. Well, we've opened up our phone lines for John Taylor Gatto. We're talking to him from New York City, former New York City Teacher of the Year and New York State Teacher of the Year, who uh, does not think the schooling should be compulsory. Our first call up is from Richmond, Virginia, a teacher. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I absolutely agree with this gentleman. I worked in uh, the education system in New York. I'm in Virginia now, which I will not ever go back. If the president wants to do something about an axis of evil, then he should look at the teachers union, the uh, pharmaceutical companies, and the politicians that allow this to go on. And I'm just going to hit on one point. The books that the children are carrying, the amount of books, that these children are carrying are causing curvatures to the spine. Uh, and the people involved know this, that they're harming the children. And uh, the schools are top-heavy administratively. The, the bulk of the people are not hands-on teaching children, and they're almost harming them most of the time. So I agree with this gentleman. John Taylor Gatto, what did you hear there? Well, I, I would take polite issue with the with the uh, accusation that the unions are responsible for this. This was established structurally by very, very intelligent people a hundred years ago. The union may profit from time to time from this, but basically blaming the unions is a red herring that leads you down uh, unproductive, uh, dead-end alleyways. The, the, the place to look for reform of these schools is in the people who who do it better. How do they do it? What are the constituencies of a, an elite private school education, for example? You should ask those questions, and there are substantive answers to them. Okay, If again, you're, you've talked about the private education. Where does the money come from to pay for these things? To pay for... Uh, once again, I would reiterate that nothing worthwhile educationally costs a penny. You can sit in an igloo or out on a raft and get a superb education. It does not require money. In fact, the public schools have far too much money, and they use that money to buy multiple interventions into kids' lives. We're already in kids' faces far, far too much. And education is something you take not something that other people give to you. And the more interventions we make in kids' lives, the more bells that ring, the more pull-out programs there are, the worse the situation gets. The, the, the media has, I think, been culpable accidentally, innocently, by really framing the debate the wrong way. El Cajon, California, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Um, my concern is um, our children's education versus our homeland security. And it seems that when I watch the news, we keep telling terrorists how to attack us. And I wonder why um, we keep doing that without offering protection. Okay, thanks for your comment. We're going to move on to New York City. Good morning. You're on with John Taylor Gatto. We're talking about public education. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, another one thing, one thing that has been missing here is, number one, the public education was set up during the beginning of this country when you had a situation where a lot of the immigrants didn't even have an education in this country. So the public school system had to be set up in order to deal with the influx of people but now, when you have a situation, when you have all these immigrants coming in this country, especially in New York, there's been a problem of not having proper teachers, not having the money to run these schools. And secondly, when it comes down to the native-born American trying to get a decent education, he's sort of pushed out or left out of the equation completely. And I've noticed one thing about the problem with the city alone is that the Board of Education is a huge monster of money coming in from taxpayers because the money has to be taken out of the taxpayers money or so-called school tax and what has happened is the money's been wasted 
as your caller has mentioned, a lot of the uh, teachers have been uh, not properly educated, don't have the proper t- t- training, and there's always a situation where a mayor comes in the, in the office, well, what are you going to do to clean up the mess? Mr. Gatto, what did you hear that you would like to respond to? Well, I, I heard an, a number of things, and with all due respect to the caller, we have more than enough money to do a superb job in New York City. The, the average expenditure per kid through public schools is about twelve thousand dollars a kid. If you go out onto Long Island, it's fifteen twenty. On Shelter Island, it's well over thirty thousand dollars a kid. And these are enormous amounts of money. Your, your your listeners who who feel that schools don't have enough money should ask themselves why the four or five states in the United States that spend the least on schools, I mean, states like Utah and Wyoming, Montana, a- absolutely have fine schools with fine results. Since it's the way this money is being spent. Cincinnati, Ohio, good morning. Yes, uh... I seen um, Mr. Gatto on Book TV a while back with his book. I believe it's called A Different Kind of Teacher. Well, Underground History of American Education and A Different Kind of Teacher are my two latest books. Yes, and I just had C-SPAN on in the background, and when I heard his name, chills just ran down my spine. I've never heard a man speak greater truth in my life, and I just thought I would call it my first time just to say I completely support him and all of his ideas. And uh, What specifically? Uh, the idea of schools being just horrible places of intimidation, bullying, this and that, the other thing, uh, that was my experience completely through school. And I am really nervous, and I'm going to hang up and listen. Thanks. Mr. Gatto. Well, I, I, I think the caller and, and you and I, Peter, and everyone else listening has good cause to be nervous. This This is an enemy within. It is a failed institution by human standards, although it serves a mass production economy very, very well by making kids susceptible to advertising and other kinds of propaganda. It turns us into creatures who can be efficiently managed. And once again, I would point to either the homeschoolers or to the elite private boarding school crowd and say, ask yourself what these people do to produce excellent results. When did your books come out? Uh, Underground History of American Education in its revised edition is just out. Uh, and you can go to my website, www.johntaylorgatto.com, and take a look at the first eight or nine chapters without paying a penny. Uh, the first book I wrote, Dumbing Us Down, came out in 1991, and I'm pretty sure it put the expression in, into the language. It sold about a half a million copies without a penny of advertising. New York City, you're on the air with John Taylor Gatto. New York City? Uh, yes, good morning, Mr. Gatto. Uh, wonderful to listen to you this morning. Um, i become addicted to C-SPAN and... Uh, I just love the program. Uh, yeah, the reason why I'm calling is uh, when the referendum on Lado was passed years ago, it was to bail out the educational system. And I keep asking people what's happening with the proceeds, and I'm being told that uh, it's being used to balance the budget. Um, I'm also taking classes at Cornell University. Uh, I'm very much involved with the labor movement. I just lost my job. It was canceled. You know, they did away with my line after 25 years. So I'm presently looking for another job right now. But I'm, but I'm, uh, pro union. And when I asked my uh, professor about what happened to the proceeds of Lotto, he told me that that was just a tax, a burden on poor people. And I like your comments on that. Mr. Gatto. Well, I, let me comment on 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 the caller's offhand remark that he just lost his job. Several extremely fine educational systems, small ones, uh, the ones used in northeastern, excuse me, northwestern Spain, the one used by the Old Order Amish, aim to produce an independent livelihood in each kid under their direction. So rather than think of your working life as, as necessarily being made up of jobs, you, you think of 
independence in, in your livelihood. You think of being useful to other people and exchanging your services for money. Kids can be taught this. That we would have a much different kind of economy uh, if schools actually taught people to have independent livelihoods. We couldn't afford to have these huge centralized corporations any longer because what they do is blot up the opportunity for work. Uh, and they return a, a, a somewhat inferior product. Uh, so, so the idea of schooling being connected to the economy intimately uh, is a necessary awakener uh, to, 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 to bring public awareness up to speed. If we change schooling substantially, the economy will disintegrate and reform as something else. You, you talk about in your article in Harper's that uh, the uh, mass schooling in the U.S. is set up on the Prussian system? It is a Prussian system. The, uh, let me turn that uh, rather recondite illusion into something that's just common sense. The three traditional purposes of schooling in human history, that is turning your child over to strangers, are first to make good people. Call that the religious purpose, even though it can be done in a secular fashion. The, the second purpose of schooling that everyone would agree with is to make good citizens. The difficulty in the United States in the 21st century is that we have redefined what that means from being an active participant and giving your opinion in a compelling fashion to being a good boy or girl and taking orders. So to be a good person, to be a good citizen, the third purpose that everyone would agree with is to make each person their personal best. Prussia, about 200 years ago, decided to introduce a novel fourth purpose. By the way, that's the name of a a film that I'm engaged in making now, and if you go to my website, you can learn about that. Uh, the fourth purpose of schooling is to look at children as human resources at the disposal of both the political managers and the economic managers, and they then shape this human resource material any way that makes management more efficient. It's a disaster humanly, even though economically, uh, it, it works quite well. Next call for John Taylor Gatto, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Good morning. Yes, Mr. Gatto, I agree with you 100%. After 13 years of researching public education, I came to the conclusion that they've become job training centers for big business. And, uh, they are. They are. And they, and they became that way 100 years ago, although it took quite a lot of time before the increments of change from the old system to call this the new system, uh, were visible. They are training centers, but not quite in the way that Karl Marx thought they were by oppressing the working classes. Think of, think of it this way. A mass production economy cannot survive unless people continuously buy, unless they spend all they earn and then mortgage their future to continue buying. Those machines run best when they run around the clock. So that what we have to have are people without much of an inner life that's self-sustaining, people who have to buy their status or buy their pleasure. And, and in that case, the economy r runs at a wonderful clip. People with an inner life are self-sustaining, who are stoic in their philosophy, would destroy this economy so that words that would lead to that effect or actions are forbidden in schools. I mean, many, many teachers come to teaching expecting, in fact, to reach for the best part of themselves, and they're slapped down over and over again, not by cruel and mean principles, although they're the agents of the slapping down, but by the necessity of a a mass production centralized economy to have people who can't think and who are susceptible to advertising and public relations. I mean, it's just common sense. It isn't ideological. Uh, Kenosha, did you have a follow-up? Yes, that's why I have my daughter in private school after doing all this research. 
Oh, Never good for put you. her in a public school again. Never. Good for you. Next call for John Taylor Gatto is from Miami Beach, Florida. I understand this is the uh, Dean of Admissions at Atlantic International University. Is that correct? That is correct. This is Dr. Weston. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, John. Hi there. Listen, I don't know if you know who we are, but I'll familiarize you briefly. We have about 27,000 students worldwide. We are probably the premier distance learning adult education university. Oh, yes, I'm well aware of you. On the face of the planet. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. You'll uh, let me remark a few things, and I'm going to try to go slowly. We have no teachers, as you know. We have assessors. Yes. We have assessors now, numbering over a thousand worldwide. We offer degrees in over a hundred disciplines. The gist of my comments this morning is to say this, and I know I'm preaching to the choir to a degree. Um, there is no real profession as teaching, illustrating, lecturing. Uh, facilitating, but no one person can inculcate knowledge into another. Of course. Learning, obviously, is the active verb, and that takes place within the student. Yes. And regardless of how a student will learn, I'm going to get this all out in one big blast, John, so I'm sorry. Yes, go, go ahead. But regardless of what, how a student learns, whatever method, the geographic or biologic anatomic location is between the student's two ears. So... That's where learning occurs. It's endogenous, not exogenous. So in effect, wherever the student is existent is a viable learning venue. We have students who learn under bushes in lake house. We have students who learn incarcerated. We have students who learn in the middle of China. And on their own really time. Matter. Okay, well, you're both on the line. Yeah. Um, is it necessary to, to somehow um, grade these students, well, judge I'll these students? It it's rather straightforward. A student has to absorb a certain amount of information. They absorb that information from a text directly concerning the particular course, whichever course they must take in order to qualify for a particular degree. They submit the work. The work is assessed by an assessor who's a qualified, credentialed expert in the field. The feedback, yes, this is right, no, this is wrong, that is the instruction. You're hitting the horse on the side of the head, keep them on the road. But without question, the horse has to pull the cart up the hill. The best that the guide can do is not get in the cart and make more weight. Mr. Gatto, let's get your thoughts on what he was talking well, about. Well, uh, the, the gentleman's right on target. Uh, what we do is school children. We don't educate them. And, in fact, we, we intervene so often that with most of the cases, we, we permanently disrail or, or, or substantially derail the education express. It's not an accident that we refer in a, in a snooty way to schools and education as pedagogy and teachers as pedagogues. The word is directly taken from the Latin. It's a class of slave who repeats what the master tells them to repeat. That, that's what all these pre-programmed uh, learnings are that pa I'm sorry, I used that expression. Learnings that pass through uh, schools are the the teaching staff is reduced unless it takes upon itself the role of saboteur of being pedagogues. They're a part of a transmission belt, and you should ask yourself where do the orders come from because they don't come from the State Department of Education. Uh, do you think it's important that all let's all American school children know some basic facts and know how to do math and know our history? What's important uh, largely isn't taught. It, it, the three kinds of literacy are vitally important. If you only did those, we would have a huge breakthrough in, in progress in the country. The three literacies are reading, which schools do fairly well, although, although not nearly as well as they could, but the other two are writing and public speaking. If you went to Andover or Episcopal or Groton or Choate, you'd find kids writing all the time, and you'd find them public speaking all the time, engaged in heated debate and discussion and presentation. Without the active literacies of speaking and writing, the reading traps you into a... Uh, a fragmented existence. 
And you have to be able to communicate and to win adherence to your to your cause or your ideas. Private schools do that extremely well. Public schools don't even try. Bay City, Michigan, you're on with John Taylor Gatto. Yes, I think I understand and appreciate the philosophical points that you're making, but I, I'm hearing a gap this morning. There are private schools with plenty of resources for their kids. There are people who can homeschool, but there are a lot of parents uh, who are working who don't have the time or the money to do any kind of homeschooling. How does that gap get filled in? I understand that the transition from the system we have now to something better would be long and arduous and it would have lots of wiggles and backing and filling. But I can tell you after 30 years in the classroom right in the middle of Manhattan that it is possible, although you have to break the law or bend it quite a bit, to it, to, to introduce the same kind of successful principles that work in homeschooling or in elite private boarding schools. Let me, let me just take an aside here that I think all of you will find interesting. Uh, in, the, in the recent and current uh, political debates about schools in the country, we have the interesting spectacle of the current president having gone to Andover, one of the top ten elite private boarding schools in the country, John Kerry, one of his leading opponents, having gone to St. Paul's, one of the top ten elite private boarding schools. Howard Dean, who's introduced to us as a populist, having gone to one of the top ten elite boarding schools in the country, St. George's. John McCain, having gone to one of the top ten Episcopal, both Roosevelt's, if I can go a little back in history, went to Groton. JFK went to Choate. Uh, we, uh, these schools only graduate together about 50,000 kids a year. There's 300 of them in the country. And if you look at the way they dispose curriculum, you have a key to a revolution in public schooling. Of course, what it would do would be to, as I said earlier, collapse the economy which is based on pyramidal management systems. Biloxi, Mississippi, good morning. Yes, hi, how you doing? I'm calling from uh, Keesler Air Force Base in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, sir, I'm a product of the uh, public schools, and um, <clears throat> I've always uh, favored the school vouchers and the homeschooling, and unfortunately, uh, teachers' unions and the politicians in their back pockets don't really support that system. I believe the public school system is abysmal. Um, I was just wondering, what do you think that the public schools need to do to try and get the unions out of there, um, try and get politicians to maybe take more of a private uh, privatization uh, tactics to try and better the uh, public schools? Sir, you have to break the monopoly. It's the centralization of schooling in the hands of, of, of politicians that has ruined most of us, had made us incomplete human beings. I, after 30 years in the business, and half of it spent in Harlem, I can say that human genius is as common as the air we breathe. The difficulty is that we don't have a leadership with the imagination to allow more people at the policy table. I really mean that. I don't think it stems from any innate evil or, or, or meaning of harm to others. It's they don't know how to do this without surrendering their own privilege. We need a radical decentralization, and that can only be done by prying the government's hands loose from the monopoly that uses the police power of the state to guarantee compliance. Last call, uh, John Taylor Gatto comes from Idlewild, California. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead with your comments. Thank you for taking my call, and thanks to C-SPAN. Um, I'm very interested in this topic, and I've 
agree with your I'm a lifetime educator and I agree wholeheartedly with your with your guest. Um, one of the things that hasn't been touched on is just how different this generation is from past generations in the sense that their entire world is made up of information and very li- there are very little in, in, uh, opportunities for students to discuss this information or to really genuinely interact with it. Um, if you think about busy parents, they are always telling their kids what to do. Teachers are telling them what to do. <laughs> Television is a one-way medium, so if they don't have the opportunity to discuss a program or discuss what they're seeing or intellectually be challenged by anything, that's again a one-way medium. And with the information age, there is an enormous amount of information on the web. But if students don't have the opportunity for um, discussing these with an adult, genuinely interacting with adults, um, how in the world are they going to think? The other thing is, if you look at adolescents, They have an enormous amount of access to information. They'll tell you anything about anything, but they really don't have an in-depth experience. They really don't know the consequences of a behavior. They don't know how to create goals and and and, and step-by-step fulfill them. Okay, thanks, caller. John Um, Taylor. You're right. I mean, your your caller's brilliant, and and, and although it may seem self-serving, I'd urge you to pick up a copy of my Underground History of American Education, which is 300,000 words, 10 years research in the writing of it, and I guarantee you, in fact, I'll guarantee you that inside of a week, which is about what it'll take you to get through the book, that many mysteries about schooling will become quick, clear, and you'll see many different ways to emerge from this hole. This is the cover of the newest Harper's Against School, How Public Education Cripples Our Kids and Why. John Taylor Gatto, thanks for being with us. A real pleasure. Thank you and C-SPAN. Don't tell me that you're going to negotiate with these people. (laughs) I mean, you're a good example of bringing them along. When your boot's on their neck, they'll come along. Is there an idea more radical in the history of the human race than turning your children over to total strangers who you know nothing about and having those strangers work on your child's mind out of your sight for a period of 12 years. Could there be a more radical idea than that? One system schooling has had a century and a half to prove itself. It is a ghastly failure. Children need the widest possible range of roads in order to find the right one to accommodate themselves. John Taylor Gatto. Captain, my captain. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. Get back to class right now. Sit down. Sit down. This is your final warning, Anderson. Yeah. I'll get up. How dare you? Do you hear me? Look at my cat. Mr. Overstreet, I warn you. Sit down. 